Hello. Uh, I will start out by saying that this is my Twitter handle, The Martian Life, and I do like tweets, but this is the last time you will see it until the last slide because I have a lot to get through, and if you're paying attention to Twitter, you're going to miss a lot. Uh, so, I am Mars. Uh, I am a tutor and a research assistant at the University of Tasmania. Disclaimer, I am also still an undergraduate, but I read about this all the time. I talk about it. I just signed a book contract about it. I um, tutor AI, and this is my one thing. I came to computing through maths, and I'm well aware of how much everyone hates maths, and so now I teach people stuff where math is involved, but you can ignore it. Like this. Uh, to the people that read the little... Uh, synopsis of what this talk is going to be and only heard the words create ML or core ML, that's not what we're doing. We're talking about why it's important to know how these things work under the hood, no matter how automated they make the process, because if you know how it works, you'll make better things. And the way the AI is, is they have inaccuracies and biases that can get in and you might never see it till the millionth time you use it, but your users will. Uh, so we're going to talk about some different algorithms in ways that aren't maths. So, first of all, the title, Machine Learning Without the Machine, there's a lot of controversy about machine learning versus AI versus data science, but arguably machine learning is where you take artificial intelligence and you give it some form of learning from mistakes it's made. So if you make a classifier and then you tell it when it's gotten wrong, that feedback is then making it get smarter over time. So it goes from being artificial intelligence to machine learning. Uh, there's also data science, which is arguably what I'm doing here, but it has a less catchy name. So. We'll move on. Uh, some of the kinds of things that you can use machine learning for are these kinds of problems where they're descriptive, which is, tell me about the data that's here. It's basically like a summary. Then there's predictive, which is, tell me from the data that's happened before that link to some output, what's going to happen if I give you this input? What output do you think it is? What do you think will happen? And then there's something that's a layer on top of that that's prescriptive, which is based on what you think will happen and your context or knowledge of what I should do in response to the thing you think should happen. Given the past, what should I do now? Uh, so there are different kinds of values that we'll be talking about a couple of times in here when we talk about what different kinds of algorithms are good for different kinds of data. And these are the, generally the four different kinds of data that you'll see. And they are numerical, which is discrete, which is that you kind of know exactly how many there are. So if your discrete set of categories are, say, whole numbers, then you know there can be one, oh, sorry, zero, and one, and two, and three, and so on. And there's theoretically a whole bunch of them, but you kind of know what categories they're going to fall into. Whereas continuous is like if you have 0, 2, 1, and there is an infinite amount of numbers between those. And this is an odd distinction because you might look at it and go, whole numbers, they go on forever. So that's just as infinite. But it means if you have a classifier for, say, temperature, and it's running off whole degrees, or it's going off regression, or something that can be anything in between, then they require completely different approaches. Uh, it also means that in any of these approaches, which you'll soon see, lots of them use plotting things on planes. Uh, that you'll either have ticks or you'll have a whole scale, uh, and that comes into ordinal or nominal. So if you have non-numerical data, like you're applying a label or a category, so uh, like a rating, if you were to, to crunch through Yelp reviews and you're trying to say positive or negative, that might be a machine learning thing you made, and that's a non-numerical label. Um, so there's ordinal and nominal, and that would be nominal, because positive and negative, they are polar opposites, and there's no... Um, kind of proximity between them, whereas you can talk about some categorical uh, values that still have an order to them. Like if you had a rating system from positive, OK, negative, all the way around, positive, OK, negative, um, then uh, OK is closer to negative than it, uh, no, negative is closer to OK than it is to positive, if that makes sense. There's still kind of a, an order or a hierarchy to it, and there's, uh, that's true for a couple of different types. Uh, so depending on how you're doing it, you can treat ordinal values like numbers. You just swap them out for numbers, and then they've got a sequence and an order, and this represents the hierarchy you've got. But nominal, you can't do that with, and that's one of the biggest mistakes that people make, is they give random nominal, nominal categorical values a number, and then they treat it like a number as if they then have some relation, and they don't. Uh, so the three different methods we're going to be talking about today is classification, clustering, and regression, and they can be used for different things. And we're only really going to touch on regression because then it required us to talk about like curve functions and no one thinks that's fun. Uh, so classification is probably the most common thing you'll see. Uh, it's used for a whole bunch of things like image recognizers, voice recognition, uh, recommendation systems, because you're basically just labeling each possible thing they could be searching for with a likelihood of it being relevant to them. 
uh, fraud detection, usually through like a user profiling to go, given these set of behavioral attributes, is it likely that they are fraudulent or legitimate? Um, and lots and lots of other things. This is basically driving all of the neural net based things that you would most commonly associate with machine learning that you see in the media. Um, so the simplest one is the naive Bayes, and this very controversial about how you say it. So forgive me, I say Bayes, and that's how it is. Uh, and it looks like this. Uh, it's much simpler if you look at it like this, and simpler again if you look at it like this. But that's not what we're here to do. We're going to do some maths. So say that you had gone out and you ate some Thai food, you ate some Mexican food, you ate some Italian food, you ate some takeout a bunch of times, um, and now you found a new Thai place and you want to know if you'll like it or not. So you wrote down these ratings at some point, and you're going to use a naive base classifier to figure out whether you are more or less likely to like the Thai food. Um, so if you use the, so we have the chances of, um, so the probability of the Thai food being in the group that is a thumb up, so I'm going to say positive, is equal to the chances of positive given input Thai times the chance of Thai overall over the chance of positive overall. And that probably still sounds like nonsense, but because we've only got eight inputs, let's do some fractions. So we have the probability of this is equal to uh, positive given Thai. So we've got one, and we've got two, and not another one. So we've got two over eight. Yeah, no, oh, three. We've got three over eight. <laughs> Um, and then we've got times the probability of tie overall. So we've got one, two, three, but then we've got a fourth here. So we've got four over eight. Um, and if you times those together, those are what? We've got 12 over 64, uh, which is what? Four, 16s, three over 16. Yeah. Um, and then count that as a thing over uh, the probability of positive overall. So we have one, two, three, Four, five. So five over eight, which can be treated as 10 over 16. Yeah. And then we kind of got something like three over 10. Uh, so we won't make you do too much maths. And then you would do the same for the opposite. So you'd be the probability of tie being negative equals, uh, so we've only got one over eight for this one uh, times tie still occurs the same amount of times. And then we've got negative is one, two, three times. And then we see we've got something like four over 64 is one over 16 over three over eight. It should be six over 16. And we can see that we've got something that is less than that, yes. Um, so by that, we would say that this fraction gives us a bigger one than this one. So if we had to pick one, We'd say it's a thumbs up, if that makes sense. But basically, the naive base classifier is a whole big math wrapper for saying the thing, the label that has been most commonly associated with the one you've got is the one you should apply. And this is usually an intro to classifications because you do all these conversions of putting it into fractions and counting them and everything, and you get out, hey, the thing you probably visually could have guessed in that most of the ties are thumbs up. Uh, and that's the way a lot of classification goes. There's a lot of number crunching, but really what it's doing is it going, hey, we're pretty sure that the universe is predictable and entropy isn't a thing, and that what's happened before is going to happen again, which you might be able to see is a flawed assumption. Um, so another common approach is decision trees, which basically looks like those bad magazine quizzes that are flowcharts. Uh, this is a stupid one, but they relatively look like that. Uh, and some of the things they do are variance reduction, which is they are completely incapable of dealing with a continuous variable, as we were talking about before. So they need to break them into likely ranges. So if you had a continuous range of numbers from zero to five, and there could be anything in there, they're going to discrete discretize them, uh, where they're going to be like zero to one or one to two, and they're going to split them into chunks and then treat them as discrete uh, numerical values. And then they have two different ways of deciding where to make these splits, because they're going to go, which attribute is going to split these into the best divisions and then deal with the rest of the divisions afterwards. And there are two different ways, which is an impurity measure, nonsense maths, and an entropy measure, nonsense maths. And basically, both of them are going, if I make this split, will it make the different groups that come out the most pure it can, or will I gain the most information from them? 
But that's nonsense until we do an example. So here we've got something that has a date, a month, a temperature, and an outlook. And using a brain, you probably notice that if you put, well, you wouldn't notice, if you put this through a machine learning algorithm, it might think that there is some relevance to the date. It might notice that on the like fifth of every month, it's really hot, and then think that's going to be true forever. So <laughs> one of the human steps in machine learning is you need to look at this and go, I don't want it to draw assumptions from the date of the month to the temperature or to the outlook. So you're going to scrap that. And that's one of the most important things about machine learning is the human that looks at it and goes, these bits are nonsense or relevance. They're going to break my model. Uh, and instead, you've now got month, temperature, and outlook. And we've got one down here that we're trying to predict. And we can see that if we just got the month up here and we split by January or February, and then we labeled them with if they were in January, it was rainy. Already, that's going to be true most of the time. And there might be no connection there, but it's going to go, that's going to make the purest groups. And then here, I might say, for then the temperature, if it is over 30 or something, um, is generally what it's going to get. So less than or equal to 30. Then you've got, only got one class here that's going to be, what? Sunny. Um, 25. Let me say 25. That's a better example. Uh, and then you have rainy. And it will generally make those groups where it then thinks that these are the rainy ones and these are the sunny ones. And for the most part, that's true. And that's good enough. It will make these divisions based on what will make the purest output groups because it doesn't see any more information than that. Uh, and so I put this in twice because a different way that you could do it is to then do it by the other way around. You could go by temperature and then you could go by month again. Uh, but it still wouldn't give you any better output because it, what it's still doing is it's going, based on the small amount of data I have, which already makes it worse because the more input you have, the better it's going to be. Uh, it's trying to put them into groups by splitting down the middle every input column that you have. So yes, it means that the more attributes you have, the more likely it is to make something meaningful, but also the more likely it is to make a big giant tree that has lots of different splits to put them in overfit little baskets, which is still not really telling you anything. So uh, yes, all of these are basically saying, what if the next node is an idiot? Uh, because I want my split to create the purest groups because the next one's not going to do anything. He's not going to get it right. Um, so then I've got approaches to try to legitimize this, like random forest, which is we made 10 different decision trees from the same thing, and then we took the most common output, and now that's the classifier. Uh, and again, this is just legitimizing a kind of flawed practice used for most of the things it's used for. It's very, very good for a specific kind of data that it is never used for. Uh, so instead, we have things like nearest neighbor, which goes, hey, all these attributes have some, side of, some kind of inherent linkage. So especially with things like weather, Yes, you can't say that any temperature will make a certain output cert uh, more certain, but you can say that there is some link between what temperature it is and what weather there is. They don't necessarily determine each other, but they might make each other more likely. That tree isn't going to notice that, but nearest neighbor might, um, which is basically like a, the thing. We model everything on an n-dimensional plane for how many, how many attributes they have, and then you give it a spot in space based on a numerical uh, map of each of its attributes and then go, what's the nearest thing around it? It's probably the same as that. But what is distance? That's a really weird concept to think of when you're mapping something in an n-dimensional space, right? That's weird. So let's have an aside for a moment, which is distance metrics, which are largely of contention among academics. They keep making new ones and fighting about it. Uh, but here are some common ones, and they have math. Everything does. These aren't particularly hard, but let's have some better examples, which is Euclidean distance is if you have a point here and a point here, then the distance is this. And then some people came and they put their fists up and they said no, because we need to minimize the root uh, square mean error, root square mean error, something. Um, and instead, they're going to say that actually the distance is this, because then that accounts for a different kind of curves. And you can kind of get that. Where you go, if I have something that's two-dimensional like this, it goes across, and then if you added a dimension, it would kind of be up here, which would be slightly longer, and you can probably intuit that it's something about triangles, but you don't want to have to do that, so they did it for you. 
Uh, and then jacket distance is used for categorical values, which you can't do this with, which is basically a, let's take their similarity divided by their dissimilarity to make a, row, to make a difference. Oh, no, minus. So basically this thing has three, and this thing has three, which means they combined has six elements. Uh, and then you get the intersection of them, which is just one. No? Five. So they have, <laughs> sorry, one. Yeah, no, you have to treat it like set theory. So they, they have four unique things, which is they have, they have a squid thing and a dinosaur, and I'm gonna draw it really badly, dinosaur, and a diamond, <laughs> and a taco. So they have four things, yep. Uh, and their intersection is one thing, which is the dinosaur, which I'm gonna draw badly again. Uh, so now we say that the, <laughs> their dissimilarity is a three, because three different things from their set that's combined are different. And that's how they make a, a rating for something that's non-numerical to say how different they are, is just these things did not occur in all of them, so they're the difference rating. Um, and that one's not as contended, even though it's just stupid. Um, and so then we do nearest neighbor, which is like if you had uh, one attribute along this plane and one attribute along this plane, so you could say like temperature and you could say outlook and then that's poor form, but what people mostly do, because these won't have any relation, but these ones will. Uh, and then you would find something and you would be like, um, should I say month? So you might have January, February, March, April, May, June. And down here you might have 20, 25, 30, 35, and you'd have some things where it was like, this one's sunny, and this one's sunny. And you have some other points, and you'd usually do this with colors. Um, and then you have like rainy, 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 rainy. And so you have a new point here. What do you reckon it's gonna be? You'd go, well, what's nearest to it? And then you pick either one neighbor, or quite often they pick K, which is they pick a random number of how many nearest to it will be relevant. Um, so three, so the three nearest things, based on these distance metrics we have, are these. And then they go, well, it's probably going to be rainy. And it's basically magic, because they just put it into this space that has no knowledge of any outside attributes, and declare it that, but at least it still has some inherent knowledge of the relationship between attributes, because instead of each one going this attribute, then this attribute, then this attribute, then this output, it makes this one point in space that's kind of like they made a new attribute that was a combination of all of the other ones. So it takes into account all of these relationships. Um, but the coolest thing, instead, is support vector machines, which is a way that they take a similar method, but it's actually really, really effective, except it only supports two different outcomes. So you have to have a binary class to apply, which is that you have n plus one dimensions to work with, uh, which is really hard to conceptualize. So let's do it with like one. So if you had things that were mapping that they were always sunny down here, and they were sunny down here, and down here they were rainy, um, then they're trying to draw a vector of n plus one dimensions through this that will bisect it into the two purest groups. So here, it would go right here. And it would say anything that's this side of this is likely to be rainy, anything that's this side of this is likely to be sunny. So if you plot something new here, it will say it was sunny. Uh, and then that works in further dimensions, that if you plotted all different things here, it will find a bisection here. Uh, and that works pretty well, but only if you have two things, because once you start bisecting them again, you can only get uh, like two power numbers, which means you would start generating nonsense categories that did not didn't correspond to anything. So then people kept finding ways to kind of fudge applying this method to other things, and it did not work. So that then died. Um, and then they have logistic regression, which is something similar to, I have an example for this later, where it's like those Facebook quizzes, which is if you have one burrito and it costs this much, and you have two burritos and it costs this much, how much does three burritos cost, even though you've never seen three burritos before to classify it, this is what you think it will cost, because we pull it out of the air with a curve function. That's how regression works, which we'll do later. But what everyone wants to know about is neural networks, because that's what everyone thinks that machine learning drives off, which it doesn't. But it is a pretty cool method in that it's a whole web of neurons whereby each one accepts input and then makes one attribute similar to neural, similar to nearest neighbors, where it makes like a value that's a summary of all the values and then applies a bias to it that it's learned from training. And then an activation function, which is supposed to make a better distribution. So if you're input used to have different value frequencies like this, it might instead make it look like this, or it might look like this. 
something that's supposed to spread them out so that things that are usually quite ambiguous will then be further distributed so they won't be misclassified. Uh, and then the output. But then your neural network will instead be bunches of these. So you might have seen uh, those diagrams, which are like, you have lots of input, and then they go into the hidden layer, and they cross around, and they each get weighted into each other's neurons, and they go all over the place. But really, they're just applying these curve functions to them, and then each one of them spits out a zero or one, which is dragging it to uh, one of some output going up and down. So really, you can see it as the input kind of has some knowledge of the output already, because they start having less and less of an effect as they go through. And they're still similar to these decision trees, in that each one knows about the one bit that's relevant to it. And that's all it takes care of, which means that they're still susceptible to some oddly specific errors, as you might have seen in image classifiers, where they've learned that if the bottom left corner is white, then it's this thing. And you'll never see it, <laughs> because you can't read what the neural net is doing. And each node thinks all the other ones are idiots. <laughs> um, so you might not be able to map what we've been doing here to classifying images. But a really simple way to do it, which is not always the way they do it, but the easiest way to conceptualize it is instead of tables of values like we've been having, instead an image will be like a table of every pixel in the image and its R value, and then every pixel in the image and its G value, and then every pixel in the image and its B value. Uh, and then using that, it can apply some matrix maths to try and enhance the outlines of things and make some new attributes where it goes, I think there's an edge here, and we've learned that if there's this color here and this color here, then that's probably this shape, and we've assigned this shape, this output. And each node, choose through it, trying to find different things, and that's how you often see that you can classify images pretty well, but when you try to generate images, you get these nonsense bits, where they've just taken these little bits they know, but they have no idea how they all fit together, and made a monster. Um, and then classifying sounds, as cheap as it <laughs> sounds, uh, is often done by just uh, making a spectrogram and then just analyzing it as an image. It's totally cheating, but it works. Um, so instead, let's go to clustering, which is like the unsung hero of machine learning because it's totally useful for getting to know your data and also for compression, which people don't really think about. Um, so as an activity, you can say that if you then plotted your data on a bunch of planes and you had things like this, all your plots, you had lots of them, how would you try to identify groups to apply labels to in this? And you might be able to see that, that you would probably think that this is a cluster, and this is a cluster, and this is a cluster. But that's actually surprisingly hard for a computer to do, because you can kind of look at it with your human brain and see that they're kind of, they're, they're closer to each other than they are to the ones outside, so more dense intercluster, intracluster than they are intercluster, and they're kind of circular, which we, associate with clusters, and we kind of get it. But because they're different densities and they have different amounts in them, and that's really hard to do. So one of the ways that people usually do hierarchical clustering, uh, usually do clustering, is hierarchical clustering, which has two different ways. And they're agglomerative or divisive. Just, just, yeah, divisive. Um, so basically, if you had those, you would have a bunch of spots. And agglomerative is like, in each step, you get a distance from whatever distance metrics you were using and join the closest ones. So you'd say, I am now doing a distance of one, and it might put these two together. You might do a distance of two, and it might put these together. You might do a distance of three, and now you've suddenly got these all together. And then you get bigger and bigger, and then you pick a random point, you cut it off. And you go, that's about how many I want, and you eyeball it, which is terrible. Um, so <laughs> then some other people went, no, you need to do it the other way around. Uh, so I'm going to try and replicate my dots here. Um, and they go, no, instead you should make them all start as one big cluster, and then you should split them based on th these different things. So they'll go, ah, oh, from the, we'll start from five and go down, which means it will split this into one, and this into one, and this into one, and then you'll split again, you might split this into one, you'll keep going, and again, you just pick a random point in your eyeball, and you cut it off, and you go, that's how many clusters I want. And people go, but that's terrible, because it doesn't allow anything of mixed densities. You're just picking your arbitrary length at which you cut it off. So instead, we get my favorite algorithm, k-means clustering. <laughs> oh, no. There's a video, and it's not going to play. Well, what it does is uh, it picks three random points. I'm going to take him off the screen. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so you start with three random points. Uh, you might be like here, and here, and here. And then you assign the nearest points. 
So every point on here, not the x's, every circle, then gets assigned to their nearest cross and told they're in that cluster. So assume that we colored them all, that like the nearest ones to this were like these ones, and the nearest ones to this were like all of these, and the nearest ones to this were maybe here. Uh, and then each one, the x then moves to the center of the dots that were assigned to it, which means that this one might move like here, and this one will probably stay about there, and this one will move over here. And then they reassign all the dots around them. And what that does is they slowly diverge into spot, no matter where you put them, generally. Like, they might make something slightly different, but they have this beautiful habit of just converging on their points, and they can make mixed-density clusters, and it's all magic. Uh, but what it doesn't do is you have to pick k in advance. So you have to look at your data that you're clustering to learn about it and kind of figure out what's in there and go, well, I think magically that there's going to be three clusters in here. And then it's just going to do it. And it's going to give you three clusters, and you'll have no idea whether that was a good number or not. <laughs> <laughs> Such a good algorithm, though. The first time you see the GIF, the GIF was so good, I'll tweet it afterwards. Uh, but then there's DB scan, which is an interesting one where you get all your little points, um, and it assigns them all because they're terribly prejudiced, uh, where they say basically you'll have a min points number, which is the minimum amount of points it has to have around it to be basically legitimized for you to take it seriously as a point. And you might say three. And then you have an epsilon, which is some random distance that you're considering. So in this case, your epsilon might be about this long. So if you're getting this, I'm going to make some centaurs. Um, so let's say we're regarding this guy. This guy right here, he has an epsilon of this long, so that's about here. He has a min points of three. He has three points in his epsilon distance. Good for him. He's now a centroid dot. Uh, now we measure these ones. And this one, eh, he doesn't. But he has a centroid dot, even though he doesn't have three. So he becomes a border dot, because he's near a guy who we take seriously. And that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and then you get this guy over here, and he has none. He doesn't have any centroid or any borders. So he's a loner, and we just completely dismiss him. He's not a cluster. He's by himself. Uh, and then you move them around. And as you get different ones, so like this one's probably also a center. But this one would be a border. This one would be a border. And this one would be a border. And then you get all these, and you can kind of see that if this was all the dots you considered here, and these ones are the center ones, you've decided they're the centers, then you pick a center between the ones that you're taking seriously, so they can all share the crown. And that's the center of your cluster. And that's pretty elegant. But again, it has issues with, now it does the opposite of k-means, which is it'll assign every dot a cluster, which is bad. This one has more of a propensity for just leaving them alone and completely disregarding outliers who might have something to say. Um, so then we've got mean shift clustering, which is similar to the before, but they basically find a centroid for every single dot that you've got, and then pick which ones to take seriously based on how much they're duplicated, which is a similar way of saying, we just don't care about you if you don't have many neighbors. Um, but you can do compression with things like, if you get an image and you assign each value of what it says RGB value is to a cluster, and then assign it that color instead, you can do things like this, where you say, I want two colors. Oh. <laughs> Very close. Uh, so <laughs> it will each pick its closest color and everything outside, even though there's a billion different blues, will instead pick blue, and everything in the text will instead pick red, and it will look like this. And it means you can do cluster, uh, clustering that then amounts to compression, which not only has a much smaller amount of values to pick from that you have to store for each pixel, but also the lookup tables are smaller. And it makes it incredibly condensed. Um, and I am going to skip some stuff, because I was basically going to say nobody wants to do regression, because it's just putting magical numbers things that come from curves that are like Facebook quizzes. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> what we learned is we learned some terminology. We learned some questions that you can answer with machine learning, probably not well. We learned about some types of values that we can use and how they work in different ways. We learned about a bunch of machine learning methods and why they're bad. Uh, types of distant metrics, which are actually incredibly legitimate, and I hope you take that away. And maths, and the friends we made along the way. OK, thank you for coming. <laughs>